welcome you this rich Sunday morning and we are delighted that you could join us. We are the Wesleyan Holiness Church, the Barbados District and together we are so glad that you have invited us to come into your house, to come into your space and we trust that today would be a beautiful day for you. We look forward to what the Lord, what the Lord will do through us and maybe to you and in you. So sit back, get involved, do what you have to do to stay with us. Maybe salvation could be yours today. Healing could be yours. Help could be yours. Peace could be yours. And so on behalf of the superintendent of the Wesleyan Holiness Church in Barbados, we say a welcome and we are so glad to have you here with us today. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence. We appreciate your goodness to us. And oh God, as we come, God, we bring this service before you. We ask God that you will bless every individual, oh God, who will participate in it today. We ask God that, Lord, oh God, you will touch the instruments, oh God, in the very medium which we are using today. We ask God that your anointing and your presence would be here in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask God today, even as your spirit, oh God, will move in this place, oh God, that, Lord, you will touch, oh God, the presenter, oh God, as he speaks the word of God today. We pray that the word of God will come forth today with power, might, and authority. We pray for your anointing. We pray your anointing would break yokes, O oh God. We pray that you would heal the brokenhearted, O oh God. We pray, God, that, Lord, indeed, you would touch those, O oh God, who need to be comforted. We ask, God, today that you would heal soul and country, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And that the word of God will move across our country, even as it is spoken today. And, God, we are praying that, God, as a result of tuning into this service today, that we would all will never be the same again. But God, that you would receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 34, 1 declares, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We've come to give the Lord a perpetual praise. Hallelujah.
We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place with the glory, God.
This is who we are. Our presence in Barbados started in 1912 in a rented property at the corner of Swan and Lucas Streets in the heart of Bridgetown. At that time, and for many years, before the name was changed, we were known as the Pilgrim Holiness Church. Today, the Wesleyan Holiness Church comprises of 39 churches and two assemblies nestled across the landscape of Barbados. From the north to the south, you can worship at one of our locations, Bentham's, Coconut Hall, Crab Hill, Fustic, or Kairos in Picornus St. Lucy. While in St. Peter, you have the Wim and New Creations in Spikestown. We have Cane Garden, Chunky Mount, and Lakes in St. Andrew, and over in St. Joseph, Coconut Grove, and Beth Eden, located in Bathsheba. In St. Thomas, you will find Prout and Hopewell, or Stop In at Hoyts, our prospect in St. James. And in St. Michael, we have Haggett Hall, Britain's Hill, Cave Hill, Black Rock, White Park, Mount of Praise in Through the Bridge, Carrington's in Welch's, and Faith in Jackman's. Pay us a visit at Woburn in Flat Rock or Ellerton in St. George. In the parish of St. John, you will find Martin's Bay, Unity in Edgecliff, Messiah's House in Messiah Street, and Victory in Welch Village. And in St. Philip, we have thickets, Ragged Point, Shekinah in Church Village, and Rima in Six Roads. Over in Christ Church, you will find Lodge Road, Ferry Valley, Maxwell, Cornerstone in Sergeant's Village, and Dunamis at Staple Grove. Additionally, Dunamis has two outreach assemblies, which meet in Silver Sands Christ Church and Lamins St. Joseph. So this is where we are. The Wesleyan Holiness Church is about transforming lives. We don't only spread the gospel. Our churches are deeply involved in their respective communities, giving, sharing, helping, uplifting, and reaching out to persons everywhere. There are various feeding programs for the elderly and homeless. Some schools have been adopted and gifts and scholarships are provided to numerous students. Many of our churches are used to host graduations, speech days, and other educational events. There's an annual primary school quiz for schools in St. John and St. Philip. We have community Sunday schools in Ferry Valley, New Orleans, and Silver Hill. There are active prison, hospital, and street ministries. We conduct joint prayer and providential projects with other denominations. Several of our churches sponsor sporting activities and competitions across communities. The church at Ellerton sponsors an annual 5K walk and run. Some communities benefit from the flea markets and the Christmas festive celebrations. Support is also given to the Parish Ambassadors Program. Over the years, the White Park Self Improvement Classes have assisted hundreds in advancing their dreams and many businesses were birthed. Now this is who we are. But we are not only here in Barbados, we are everywhere in the Caribbean. We have churches in 19 countries across the region from Trinidad and Tobago in the south, all the way to Jamaica in the north. And they fall under the leadership of Barbadian Reverend Dr. Joel Comerbatch, our general superintendent, a man whose roots go way back to the fields and hills of Chalky Mount and Lakes in St. Andrew. It was the initiative of Dr. Comerbatch that saw the Wesleyan churches rallying to provide support to Dominica after they were ravished by Hurricane Maria. And again, we have rallied to support St. Vincent after the eruption of La Soufrière volcano. Now that is who we are.
And it doesn't stop there. We are indeed Wesleyans to the world. As you will find a Wesleyan church in over a hundred countries spread across the globe. We are Wesleyans to the world. We are Wesleyans with the word and with God. We are working as Wesleyans to win souls to Christ. We are working as Wesleyans to help meet the needs of our people. We are working as Wesleyans to help keep hope alive. Visit us at one of our locations in Barbados or log on to wesleyanbarbados.org for more information. God bless you. And your sons and your Only daughters you shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. Yes, this is the hour where the least of these will come out of hiding and be endowed with strength, power, authority, and revelation concerning the revival of miracles, signs, and wonders. And yes, I will pour out my spirit upon those that are positioned with clean hands and pure hearts ready to receive from me. And yes, I will place my seal upon their hearts and fill their mouths with fresh revelation from the throne. And yes, these are the days where the spirit of Azusa Street will be revived where the Lord will respond to the cries of desperation from his people and people will gather by the hundreds of thousands to be healed, delivered and set free from sin, sickness and disease. So ready yourselves for this coming movement. I'm coming with fresh wind and he who is not anchored in righteousness will not have the capacity to contain this fresh infilling of my spirit.
restore our families into right relationship with you, Father. Release us into another realm of your glory. Empower the body of Christ to walk out your call. Unify our communities, Father. Humble us under your mighty hand. Raise our hearts, Lord. We call forth the fivefold ministry gifts. We call forth servant leaders. Shake us, Lord. Wake us, Lord. We decree your fire. Good morning, Barbados. Thank you for receiving the Wesleyan Holiness Church into your homes. Today marks the culmination of 40 consecutive days of intercessions across our district with participation of each of our 39 churches. Great has been the grace of God on each day as we prayed for you, your homes, your communities, Recovery from brokenness, healing for the sick, restoration of our fair land as we navigate the COVID experience and the post-volcanic ash issues. We will encourage you not to lose hope, but to trust God with us for our way forward. Permit me to share with you today a devotion, and I'm taking it from Acts chapter 3, verses 2 to 9. I won't read the entire story, but it is the story of the man who was, who was healed at the gate, beautiful. Now across the Christian church in the West today, it is celebrated what is called the coming of the Holy Spirit. I will address you today on spirit-empowered ministry while using this story. Now, I love... Christmas, the celebration of coming to the coming of Christ or the incarnation with all of its social and cultural fanfare. As a Christian, I treasure Good Friday and Easter Sunday. For who can contend the significance of those events to the wisdom and power of God? But for me, it is the coming of the Holy Spirit which seals it all. For for me, it represents a conclusion of a promise of a loving Heavenly Father. Yes, the coming of the Holy Spirit is an expression of the love of God and the mercy of God for us as human beings. It represents the reality of a holy God coming to dwell in the inner beings of believing sinners. It also represents the reality of a holy God granting each recipient the grace, guidance, and good-mannered behavior necessary to please God. It also represents the reality of a supernatural God enabling an ordinary person to do exceeding, abundant, above all that he or she may think. It represents the limited, the, un the unlimited occupational presence of Jesus Christ in the earth. I say unlimited because while he lived in the earth more than 2,000 years ago, he was limited by space and time in his existence, but not since the coming of the Holy Spirit. To my mind, God is unlimited through the gift and the presence of his Holy Spirit amongst us today. In the 32 years after Pentecost, the whole world heard about Jesus Christ. They did not have printing presses or church buildings, airplanes, or express trains. The disciples traveled by foot, I assume by horseback where appropriate, or wind-assisted ships to spread the gospel. And the same power that changed Peter from a reed to a rock changed others. The same power that changed some fearful, hard-hearted disciples also changed others. In turn, they change their world. 
and with the freshness of the Holy Spirit, coupled with a shameless determination and a willingness to work, the disciples took the gospel from everywhere to everywhere. And today, as a Wesleyan community, it is our desire to follow this pattern as well, to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ across the world, everywhere to everywhere. For we believe that God is not our problem. We believe that God is the solution. God is not the one causing us issues and problems and making us sick. The Bible says we have an enemy who comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So God is not the problem today. God is our solution. Amen. I want to share with you today three thoughts on, from this passage. Spirit-empowered ministry. The scripture says that there was a man who was lame from his mother's womb. He was born disabled. And until he was an adult, he was carried to the gate beautiful. And there he would be every day. And according to the text, he would beg alms of all those who pass by to go into the church. One day, Peter and John passed by. And the scripture says, as was the custom, he held out his hands to beg alms from Peter and John. But on this occasion, not too hence removed from the day of Pentecost, Peter looked at him and says, fasten your eyes on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now that's, that's an, an astounding statement to someone who is disabled. To say to them, we have no money, but we're going to give you what we have. And I am saying this this morning, that it is what we have as a church. It is what we understand that we have. And it is what we, con we are convinced that we have through the word of God. That we can give such as we have. We can give spirit-empowered ministry. And that's the call for the church today. We have no relevance Except we are able by the grace of God to speak into the lives of people and to demonstrate the works of Jesus Christ just as he did. Why? Because Jesus says, while I was in the world, I was the light of the world. But now I'm leaving and you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And therefore, believers in Jesus Christ, we're calling you to what I call spirit-assisted ministry, spirit-empowered ministry today. I want you to look with me at three aspects of spirit-empowered ministry. First of all, it's changing power. Spirit-empowered ministry has the capacity to transform and to change its subjects. It has the power to change our personalities or our attitudes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, any man that is in Jesus Christ is now a new creature, a new creation, a new species. It does not stop there, you know. It says, all the things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It's as though God has forgiven completely our yesterday. And he said, there is a certain future ahead for you. Do not consider the things of old, the things of yesterday, but consider the pathway that is before you. I like how Joseph puts it as he spake with his brethren. He says to his brothers, and he went through a lot of hurt, pain, sorrow, abuse in his family. But when he met them, he said to his brothers with his father present, God has Help me to forget the toil of yesterday. God has a way of enabling us to forget. It does not mean that we do not remember the incidents or remember the pain and the sorrow. But what he does is that he, is an, he enables us not to live in relation to the impact of those things on our lives. 
He enables us to transcend them. And hence, we live different lives because our focus has become different. We have spirit-empowered ministries enables us to change and to be transformed in our personalities, yes, but also in our purpose. People who lack direction, lack a purpose in life, and an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ brings a new sense of direction, a new sense of determination, a new way of living. But not only that, there's also the change of practices. There is the, the regular saying, the things I used to do, I do them no more. And I want to give you a case study from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 3, 9, 1 to 6. It's the, the man called Saul of Tarsus that wreaked havoc in the churches. And yet the Bible says the man met Christ on Damascus Road. And in an instant, he was changed. In an instant, he was forgiven. But Saul, his name was changed to Paul. And the scripture tells us that through an encounter with uh, Ananias, the scales fell off his eyes. His body was strengthened. And the soul that we knew before, now changed to Paul, became an ambassador of Jesus Christ. The same man whom yesterday and day before was persecuting the church, now that man is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whereas he was saying before, don't believe in this Jesus because he is not the real stuff. He is not the Messiah. Now an encounter with a real Jesus, Paul is preaching Christ and him crucified. Amen. Paul goes into Corinth and he says, My brethren, I cease not to know anything amongst you except Christ and him crucified. For to me is live, to live, and to, to die is to gain. So, we have, by virtue of spiritually empowered ministry, we have the capacity to change. I want to say to you this morning, we can change there is no condition that God cannot change. There is no condition that the gospel cannot change. Jesus is able to change every circumstance that confronts us this morning. But let me hasten on because in the second place, there's what I call spirit-empowered ministry. It has compassionate power. Yes. I challenge those who serve in our church I challenge our pastors, and from time to time when I speak at various churches, I encourage our members and encourage our leaders, encourage our ministers that love must be the basis of ministry. We must have a love for the people to whom we minister. We must not, we must not see people or deem people as mere statistics or targets to fulfill our quota of outreach. And I want to restate that because people are sensitive and people know whether you care for them or you care or not. People must never be deemed as mere statistics or targets to fulfill our quota of, our, of outreach. We must genuinely love the people that we go after. Sometimes it might mean putting aside the gospel track or putting aside the, the, the Bible uh, lesson that we have planned and engaging them right where they are so that people know that we care and that the God that we serve cares for them as well. I like to see our ministry as God's hands extended to the world. Because he is, in the he, he is in the world through us. And the, the only God that some people will recognize or some people will know is the God in us. And the God who reaches them through us. There is compassion that grows. And the more and the closer you get to God, the more compassion for the things that he has compassion for will grow in our lives. Paul says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 31, he spent three years with a church. And here's what Paul says. Paul started that church with simply 12 members. And by the time he left, history suggests 
that that church in Ephesus could have been in the thousands. And yet after three years, Paul says to this church, he says to the elders, he says, my brethren, I cease not with tears to bear you up before the Lord every single day. That's what I call love. That's what I call compassion. He didn't have to do it. He had a thriving church. But he knows that he is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And the compassion, the same compassion that Jesus had, is the same compassion that he needs to demonstrate. And compassionate power also have or is demonstrated with a compassion that gives. It's not only a compassion that grows, but a compassion that gives. It is not selfish. It does not seek its own. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 13, the Bible says, Paul was ready to give his life for the cause of Christ because he loved the people of Jerusalem. He loved his fellow countrymen and he would risk his life just to get the gospel to them because he cared about their welfare. He cared about their, about their well-being as well, their spiritual well-being. But there's also a compassion that goes. A compassion that goes. Today in our church, there are many people who, who are interested in serving, but they want to serve right in the local church. They are interested in doing things for God, but it has to be something that is done in the local church. But there's a lot of ministry to be done because there are a lot of hurting people. There are a lot of people that need God, that need the hope of God in their hearts and in their lives. I've come across persons who would only serve if it is something in a local church. If it is something that's done from the platform. I want to say to you today that the God that we serve has given you a testimony because he has touched your life. And where you work where you live, your operation during the day can be times where you meet people and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Thirdly and finally, spirit-empowered ministry also has converting power. I call it converting power. To convert means to change. But there's a conversion from, first of all, a life of sin. Could you imagine that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were converted. Some of these people perhaps were saying, crucify him some days earlier. Maybe some of them who were in that crowd had the guilty verdict of this man away with him. And yet, some days later, with a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, these people are surrendering their hearts and are surrendering their lives to Jesus. In fact, before Peter gives his altar call, the scripture says, men cried out, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And the scripture says on that day, there were about 3,000 people being baptized. And I assume there were men. And if there were 3,000 men, there had to be a, a, a plethora of women being baptized as well. You see, the power of God, being empowered by the Spirit, has the capacity to change lives when we preach the gospel under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just techniques and gimmicks. But really and truly change. There's a woman at the well. Jesus had a dialogue with her. Jesus didn't preach. He didn't argue. He simply had a, a discussion. And by the end of that discussion, the Bible says the woman was leaving Jesus and going and calling a, a number of men saying, come and see this man who told me everything that I did. Or there is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus in today's, uh, in today's um, day would, would be a, a, a customs officer or perhaps a VAT officer. By description. But the truth is, Zacchaeus worked for the Roman government. And Zacchaeus extorted people, poor, all kinds of people. The man got rich out of extorting people for their taxes. He had one conver conversation with Jesus Christ. And the scripture tells us that by the time that conversation was finished, 
There is no record that Jesus says, Zacchaeus, you have to give back people the money. There is no record that Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, uh, you have to confess me and you have to do this in order to be saved. As a result of the conversation, Zacchaeus was walking out saying, Lord, all these people that I've extorted, I'm going to give back to them four times as much. Spirit-empowered ministry has the power to change lives from sins. But not only, not only a life from sin, but it has the power to convert persons from the power of Satan. We have an enemy. Lest we forget. There is God. There is human beings. But there is another player involved that very often go unnoticed. And when men and women yield to his temptation, yield to his deceptive tactics, they come under the spell and, and, and the dominion of Satan. But I have good news because Jesus says, the word of God says, that Jesus has come to destroy or undo the works of the devil. And when we, Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 says, when we come to Jesus, when we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says that we as a result of yielding to Jesus, we are transferred from the tyrannical rule of Satan to the kingdom of God or the son of his love. It has the power to convert from the power of Satan. Some people are under the power of Satan and they're not, they don't seem to be aware. But I say to you today, if your life is broken, repeatedly broken, if you have no regard for God and no regard for things of God, and if you perpetually will do violence and hurt and maim people, you have to ask yourself, do you have company? And the company is not human company or God company. Do you have the company of that evil one called Satan? The truth is, whether you've lived all of your life living for Satan or not, the power of Jesus Christ is able to break any bondage of Satan of your life. Because Satan does not have ultimate power. Jesus has all authority in heaven and in earth. And lastly, his converting power can convert us from a life of slavery. Slavery to the wickednesses and the iniquities of sin. We are no longer under law. We are under grace. And notice I say we're not under law. But we must understand that the law of God is perfect. The law of God is not imperfect. The law of God is not an enemy. The law of God is perfect. David says it converts the soul. It is more to be desired than fine gold. That's what David says about the law of God. But the law of God by itself becomes weak. Why? Because of human nature. And because we are prone by Nature, to be servants of sin and servants of our own ways. But through the grace and the goodness of Almighty God, we can change. I said we can change. Now in conclusion, I want to say that Wesleyans believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I've come across one or two. I've come across a couple of non-Wesleyans who have concerns as to whether we believe as a church, as a denomination, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me say categorically, let me say categorically that we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is present. We believe that he gives gifts to men. And we believe in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The devil is a liar. We believe those things. We believe the Holy Spirit is a third person of the Trinity. Yes, we are Trinitarian in doctrine. But we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit can transform any life. And that the Holy Spirit is the only authentic member of the Godhead in the earth today because Jesus left the earth and says, I'm going to send you somebody else. He's going to send you the comforter. And thank God, at the day of Pentecost, the comforter came. He's present in the world today. I said he's present in the world today. And he's present in the Western Holiness Church. We have just come off of 
40 days, this today is a culmination of 40 days of prayers. And it's been a thrill to see the movement of people and the desire of people to prayer and get in the presence of Almighty God. Yes, the Holy Spirit is working and at work in the Wesleyan Holiness Church. To God be the glory. I wouldn't want to be in a church where nothing happens and the Holy Spirit doesn't work, doesn't move, and he's absent. Are you there with me? Now, when I was in primary school, some friends of mine, along with myself, were fascinated by the little Phillips battery. This battery had a base with two terminals at the top. The battery measured up approximately two inches long. What fascinated us as little boys was that we discovered that if you were to put your tongue right between those two, uh, those two uh, terminals, it would give you a nice sensation. And that sensation was pretty cool as little boys. I remember doing that the first time at age seven. And the, the tickle it gave me on my tongue, though it shocked me a little bit, it didn't shock me enough that I wouldn't go back again to do it. I did that several times until it was probably about 10 or 12. I, the last time I did it, I was probably at secondary school. But the, the sensation was shocking and every time I would do it get the sensation get the shock remove it from the tongue but go back go back for it again listen to me carefully now this is the point I want to make I'm not just sharing information with you to let you know that as a young boy I had some of those days but of the enormous potential of those small batteries all we were using the batteries for is to get a little tickle on the tongue. But as we grew up, we realized that those batteries were used to power up all kinds of toys. They're used in microphones and several other electrical devices. So what was simply a toy for us to give us a little sting and a, and a little thrill, really and truly, in the hands of entrepreneurs was able to power and be a benefit and a blessing to multiply persons. Are you there with me? I'm going somewhere with this. You see, there are many in the body of Christ, because I'm about to close, many believers today who've, who, who go to church for just a touch from God, and they have not gone beyond the touch. For many, the Holy Spirit is simply a touch me power in order to savor the thrill and get another touch but the truth of the matter is that the same power that tickles you when you come to church and in some churches they say you know I just feel this going up and down my spine the same power that does that is the same power that gives wisdom that grants knowledge to people in order to benefit humanity I want to be part of God's plan that the Holy Spirit and the same power is able to use me and to use you and to use Wesleyans and to use uh, Pentecostals and Nazarenes and, uh, and Moravians and all in sundry to improve the lot of humanity. Are you there with me? The same wisdom that was in Jesus, the same wisdom that is in the Father is the same wisdom that is in the Holy Spirit. Lest we simply relegate the Holy Spirit down to a thrill and down to just a touch me and I go into church because I just want a thrill. Listen to me. There is more to the Holy Spirit than that. In fact, God wants to empower you and I so that we can be of utmost blessing to humanity. That when pastor calls and says, we are going into this district, you will feel that sense of empowerment. You know why? Because that district needs wisdom. It needs artisans. It needs skilled people. It needs all kinds of people that the Holy Spirit is able to equip and give power to. Because that community will only experience God to the extent that the church of Jesus Christ permits God 
in his Holy Spirit to reach out to them. So you see, my friends, as I close this today, that we have a good heritage. And God wants to do something marvelous above and beyond what we have ever known. At my age, I want to see the kingdom of God advance in our country. I want to see our churches become places where people come and people are rescued. Not only from their sinful ways, from their pathways of iniquity and their disheartenedness and all kinds of traps that they have been in. And they find Jesus Christ to be the source of life and the source of power in their lives. May God grant this today. On this day where we commemorate the coming of the Holy Spirit, whether we are Baptists or whether we are Moravian, whether we are Anglican or whether we are Wesleyan, whether we are Nazarene or New Testament Church of God or Christian Mission, and the list can go on. Together by the grace of God, we can respond to our country because Barbados needs us. It needs a church that's on fire for God. And may God be in our presence today. And let's say, use us, Lord. Here are we like Isaiah. Send us in Jesus' name. God bless you. God enrich your life. God prosper your way. And may God bring to pass all those things that he has promised us in his word. And you by faith have taken hold and taken charge of them. God bless you.
We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We are the Wesleyan Holiness Church, the Barbados District. And we appreciate you taking time out to bring us into your home. Do check us out. Give us a call. Give us a shout. Give us a knock. Come visit us one of these Sundays. And we'll be happy to welcome you into our churches. We pray that God will continue to bless you and strengthen you as you go forth. And now... We ask that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you both now and forever. And we all agree and say, Amen. 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 God bless you.